Good morning, and welcome to Grace and Truth Christian Fellowship. I just want to share a few things with you and encourage the church family that God is in control through the times that we're in. And I want you to know as I share this message, I see you here. I see you sitting here, and, and I can see you in this section, in the middle, and over here. And so for me, I just want to share my heart with you and let you know the things that God is doing currently in the days we're living in. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the time together. We ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would just continue to move mightily in our hearts and that you would keep us, Lord, and allow us to know you in a greater way that the very cry of our heart is to know you, to be like you. And I believe, Lord, these times that we're in, you're accomplishing that work. And we just give you all praise, and may we shine brightly for your kingdom and your glory. May you teach us now and give us ears to hear. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. As I shared before, I believe that the things we're going through are a prelude to what's up ahead. I believe it's kind of a, a rehearsal. It, it, it's a way that the Lord is going to call the world and yet bring the church into a, a greater place with him, uh, refining us, making us more like him. And the things that I'm seeing in the world today with the, the coronavirus, with the economy, with the, the different things of, of the media, we're seeing that God is stirring his church so that we would prioritize the things in our life, that, that the natural order of things for our heart to be, to be on the Lord and to be toward the Lord is happening through these events. In fact, the bigger picture that I saw is found in Revelation chapter 17. So turn to Revelation 17. As we look in Revelation chapter 17, we see God speaking to this, this mystery Babylon. And I know some see it as a city and some see it as you know, uh, other, other situations that will be upon the world in the future. But I also see it as it is speaking to the system of the world, to the way the world's going to be, and it's first speaking to the way the church is, to the way the, the, the spiritual atmosphere is within society at the last days. And let's jump right into verse 1 of chapter 17. It says, And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talketh with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So here God is seeing this image, or, or declaring to us this image, John seeing it, he's declaring to us this image. And this image is one who has adulterated the world around her. That is brought in falseness and, and error into the world. And this first section in Revelation chapter 17 is talking about this religious order, this religious people that this religion of the world is going to be adulterated. It's, it's going to be corrupt. And God is going to warn his people to not be partakers of that. It, it moves on into verse 5, and it says, And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots, the abominations of the earth. You see, people, there are teachings, there are our beliefs that are in the culture we live that have migrated into the church as a whole, universal. Some of the teachings that God says are abominations, some of the, the, the thought patterns of the world that are abominations to God have moved into the church. And there are many religious orders and institutions that have bought into it. They've adapted the cultures of the world, even though they violate the word of God. 
It's easy to allow the things of the world to creep in, even in our religious beliefs, even in our, in our convictions. All of a sudden, those convictions that have been grounded by the word of God can begin to change and can migrate into the thoughts of this world that we're living in. And God is warning us not to drink of the wine of that cup, not to be partakers of it, that we, the church, need to look for the, to the word of God and get back into the word of God and realize that my faith is going to line up with God's word, not the culture around me. That, yeah, I may walk differently than the world around me. In fact, I will be perceived as the problem in this world. But I want to stand firm and what God says is true. And these are the days that we're in that God will use to realign us, to bring us into a proper view of his word, and maybe to reestablish some of the convictions that he gave us, even early on in our faith. And we found ourselves drifting away from them. And God is using these events to get his people back into the word, to have devotion with their family, to be able to pray together, to come together as a body of Christ encouraging each other. In fact, I've spoken to many brothers and these are the days that God is stirring their heart in a more powerful way because these are the last days and God's making his church ready. So he says, at the last day, at the tribulation period, there will be this, this blanket of deception, this, this religious concept that's going to flood the world, and God's going to have to judge it. But the prelude, we've already seen many churches falling away from the word of God, not even believing that the Bible is the word of God, and not even standing on the principles and the the teachings of the Bible, but adopting the culture around it. So this prelude is encouraging God's people to get back to the word of God. In fact, look what it says as you jump into verses 8 and 9. And the beast which thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder who will be on the earth during this time, during the great tribulation? Not, not the prelude, but the great tribulation whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they beheld the beast that was and is not and yet is. That those people that are left in the world that hold on and say that they're believers and and God or a higher power, whatever they declare, but they're not truly saved and born again. They're the ones he's talking to. But when I see how God is addressing the people in the tribulation and realize that we're in this dress rehearsal, if you're this prelude, that it gets my attention. And I want to say, Lord, clean me up. Sanctify me. Do the work, Lord. You who begun the good work, I surrender and ask, Lord, that you would complete it. That my heart cries out, Lord, I want to stand on what is true and right and pure. I want to know you in a greater way. And as I shared before, I believe God's answering those secret cries of the heart that have been prayed all these years because he's changing us. He's realigning us. Well, here it goes on and it says in verse 15, and I believe that this is, uh, well, let me just read verse uh, 9 because it's important. It says, and here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are the seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. I truly believe those seven mountains, if you look from, from God's vantage point, are the seven continents, the, the continental plates, the seven continental plates that, that, that look like mountains as they rise up out of the water, the continents of Asia, 
Africa, North America, South America, Antarctica, Europe, and Australia, that what he's basically saying is this influence that has spread is spread worldwide. In fact, look what it says in verse 15. It says, And he said unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are the peoples, multitudes, and nations, and tongues. They're all the people. The influence of our culture has permeated worldwide and unfortunately into the church. And that's why in these days we need to be looking to the Word of God and saying, God, the stuff that I've embraced, if it's not of you, just, just rip it out. Take it away. And allow my thoughts and my heart and my faith to be grounded on your word because he's getting his bride ready for his return and he's looking for a pure bride one that is holy and I've realized long ago man I, I can't make myself pure and holy I, 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 you know how it is I, I commit I say Lord today today's the day Lord I'm going to look and walk like a Christian and, and that, that last, I mean, that, that can last probably the whole time that I'm still laying in bed. But as soon as my feet hit the floor, something comes up and man, I just can't keep it. You know what these days are showing me? They're showing me I need Him more than ever before. I need the Lord to do the work. And I need the Lord to complete the work. In fact, my dependency is growing more upon him than away from him. And these kind of trials are the very things that God will do to cause our hearts to turn to him, to depend on him. Because where else are we going to go? Who else do we have? And so God is stirring our heart and aligning us up spiritually with the truth of God's word there's another aspect to this another part that we see in scripture that God's going to judge and it's found in chapter 18 of Revelation and let me read it to you it says and after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power and the earth was lightened with his glory and he cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, and behold, of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. That if you, if you view now Babylon as the system of the world, the world itself, the... the the continents of the world, the nations of the world, the, the commerce that takes place between the nations, the material wealth, the materialism of the world, God is saying, I'm going to bring it down and I'm going to collapse it because it's filled with all kinds of evil and greed and wickedness. Man, you don't have to look far to see that this world is filled with evil, greed, and wickedness. You don't have to look far to see that the things that we once held true in morality and, and things that were right have been discarded. In fact, they're being belittled by the media and those around us. That God has said, this world, these nations have become corrupt. Unfortunately, church, we see it even within our own nation. As people that try to share, like the My Pillow guy, about getting back and reading the Bible, and the media goes ballistic to try to say, Oh, how dare he say such a thing? Where not too long ago, the Bible and the truths of the Word of God were upheld and spoken openly. The world around us is corrupt and God's judgment is coming upon that world. But again, I believe that 
that that in, in the fullness is yet to come. But I believe that the prelude, the beginning of sorrows, we're in. And we're seeing the same thing as what God speaks of here in Revelation. It goes on and it says, For all nations have drunken of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have whacked writs rich through her abundance and delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sin, that you receive not of her plagues. You see, God is calling his people to come out from the world. He even tells us to don't be of this world, to, to come out and be separate. That the world system and the things that people have trusted in, the things that bring them excitement and hope and, and, and false security and peace are being ripped away. And the people are going nuts. They, they, they have a hard time with their things, their conveniences, their delicacies being taken away from them. But I believe that God will use these seasons that we're living in to realign our heart so that our hope, our peace, our joy, our happiness, our contentment are not going to be found in the material things or the conveniences of this world, but they're going to be found in Christ. That's where our hope and contentment is. It's in the Lord. And we're seeing it before our very eyes the depletion of the economy. And you may be experiencing some really hard times. Maybe losing your job. Maybe seeing your, your retirement, your 401k plan just plummet. But I know this, that my God will supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. That my God will take care of me that my God will make sure that I am protected, that he says that I can be content in the very simple things because really my contentment is in him. And I'm telling you that that is happening where people are seeing priorities shift. These troubled times that we're in, all of a sudden God is realigning the priorities of our life. It, it, it's like the things that were pushed down because of the world and because of the busyness of life are now starting to bubble back up to the surface, regain the positions of prominence in our life. You know, I travel around a lot. You know what I'm seeing? I'm seeing moms and dads and kids out bike riding. I'm seeing couples take walks. I'm seeing families that, that, that Kathy and I and Dustin went to one of the parks and, and I saw families there gathering and I'm seeing people reprioritize their life because God will use the troubled times we're in to bring into order the things that really matter and to show us that our peace and our contentment are found in him and him alone. So he says, in this time in Revelation, I'm going to take it all down. I'm, I'm going to eliminate it. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities, the iniquities of the world. Look at verse 14. And the fruits that thy soul lusted after, are departed. They're departed from thee, and all things which were dainty and goodly are departed from thee. And thou shalt find them no more at all. That man, I, I don't want the same things that I found delight in or trusted in to be available. I, I just want to find my peace and my joy in the Lord. And, and the things that he's given me. For you single people, man, your joy is in serving God. 
Same with us married people. And us who are married, to find the joy in your spouse. To find the, the satisfaction within your kids. To find time served with the Lord as a richness and inheritance that you've been given. You know, of all the tribes of Israel that had different lands as, and parcels for their inheritance, he told the Levites, the priest, which you and I are called the royal priesthood, that the Lord is their inheritance. You see, he's really realigning my heart to where I know he is all I need. And all this is going to be taken away. All of it's going to be gone. In fact, look at verses 17 through 19. For in one hour, so great riches has come to naught, and every shipmaster and all company and ships and sailors and as many as trade by the sea stood afar off and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? And they cast dust on their heads, and they cried weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, the great city, wherewith we were made rich, and all that had ships in the sea by reason of their coastlines. For in one hour is she made desolate. And I thought about that, and I thought, you know, how quickly this whole thing has come upon us. I mean, how quickly, when we first heard of the coronavirus, to where it migrated into America and we heard the first case, and then many more cases, and then, and then within a matter of weeks, all of a sudden they're shutting things down, closing things off, changing our entire way of living as we saw the cases increase, the death toll rise. And I thought, Lord, how quickly everything that the world has, has trusted in can just collapse. But Lord, you will stand forever. That you are the thing. You are the one that will never fail. That can never be taken away from me. Man, you can take anything that I have and you can take it away. The world can, but no one can take Jesus Christ away. He said to all of us, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So where am I going to put my trust? Am I going to invest myself in the stock market? Oh, maybe it's going to rise. And then, oh no, it fell. Or am I going to invest myself in the living God who created me, loves me, saved me, and died for me? Man, that's a no-brainer. I'm going to invest myself in the Lord. That's where I'm going to need to invest all of me and say, Lord, man, I am all in for you because that is the security and the hope and the contentment and the peace that's found in him. How quickly our lives can change but I am so grateful that he has my life in his hands. And he says, I am the Lord God and I changeth not. We can trust in him. Hey, quickly, turn to 1 John chapter 2. Here in 1 John chapter 2, it encourages us here in this same kind of concept as we drift down a few verses. But in chapter 2, as you look in verse 12, he says, I write unto you little children because your sins are forgiven you for his namesake. I write unto you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you young men because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you little children because you have known the Father. I write unto you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you young men because you are strong and the word of God abideth in you and you have overcome the wicked one. You see, God through John is writing to his entire church. 
No matter where you're at, whether you're just newly saved or you're still young in your faith or if you're mature and you're doing battle, I want to encourage you that are doing battle, man, you stay in the fight. It's a good fight. And you, you come out on top. Man, you're, you're going to win. And you have the word of God. You have the ability to take scripture, to stand on it, to embrace it, to hold it. Man, don't get weary in well-doing. You keep fighting the good fight. It's worth it. And for you older saints, you seasoned spiritual saints in the Lord, you know, I'm kind of talking to me now. I'm, I'm becoming one of them. Man, we got a lot of wealth to pass on. We walked with the Lord for many years. It's not time to just kind of seclude yourself, but to allow God to pour you out into the lives of the other believers, to encourage them, to strengthen them, to pass on a word of knowledge to them, to share some life experience with them and testimonies that will encourage their hearts. And back to the young children, it's time to grow up. It's time that God would take you from wherever you're at and encourage your heart, I need to grow. I need more of him. I need to learn of him. I need to serve him and walk with him. Man, I can't, I can't crawl anymore. i got to get out of the crib, start walking with Jesus. And then he goes on and he says here, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You know, he's really realigning us. And my love in areas are shifting back to him, back to the Lord. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh... Man, the passions and the desires of her own flesh, the lust of the eyes, the, the covetousness, man, I gotta have it, I want it, I want what the world has, and the pride of life. Man, it's, I'm right, it's about me. It's not of the Father, but of the world. Man, that's the behavior the world has. But look what it says, and the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. Man, within an hour, within a moment, Everything the world loves and trusts in could drop, fall away. But he that does the will of God abideth forever. I think God's realigning. God's, God's renewing. The Lord's reestablishing the priorities. I know they are in my life. I'm pretty sure they're happening in yours. This is the time for the church to grow. Man, and the promises that God has for us are sound and, and, and bring stability. We'll close with a few. Isaiah. Forty three. Look at beginning in verse two, it says, And when thou passest through the waters, I'll be with you. And through the rivers, they won't overflow you. And when thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. Sounds like I can trust him. Sounds like I can hold on to him. Because I can tell you this, he's holding on to you. He's got you. He'll walk you through it. He'll see you through. And not just to get you to the other side, but with purpose and vision and reason. Look at Jeremiah. If we turn to Jeremiah chapter 29. Look what it says in verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you a hope and a future, an expected end. That God has a future, a hope. His thoughts to you are, I want to encourage you. I want you to grow. I, I have plans for you. I've got a purpose in life for you. I, I, I've got things for you to do. I've got opportunities that are going to open up before you. Then shall you call upon me, 
and you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you, and you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. Man, church, this is the time to search for God with all our heart, to seek him and say, Lord, here am I. What do you have for me? I want to serve you with my whole heart. Thank you, Lord, for taking the things that I've crushed down and bubbling them back up into the priorities that are right and true and realigning my heart toward you. Thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing. And I'm going to hold on. I know it's scary, Lord, but I'm going to hold on tight to you because I know you got me. And church, he does. And the last verse I want to read is found in uh, Psalm 32. Psalm 32. Psalm 32, look at verse, uh, beginning verse 7. Talking about the Lord. Thou art my hiding place, for thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with the songs of deliverance. The Lord says, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way that thou shalt go. I will guide thee with my eye. What he's saying is, I'm going to guide you as you look to me. Not only will I keep you and hold you, not only do I have a hope and a future for you, but I've got a path for you to walk. And it's by my vision the Lord says. I'll guide you with my eye, my vision, my wisdom, my understanding. Man, keep looking to him because he's going to guide you to a, an expected end, to a hope and a future, to a plan and a purpose. He's going to allow your life to come alive. And I've realized with this situation how much I need him You see, the things that we face, this virus that we face, is not something that I can just tackle myself or grab and throw out of the way. Man, my dependency is on him. And isn't that the way it should be? That our dependency would grow on him more and more. Well, know that he's with you, he loves you, he'll keep you. But more than just keeping you, He's got a purpose and a plan for you. Let him realign you. Oh, maybe it it hurts a little bit at first, you know, if you've ever gone to a chiropractor and all of a sudden you hear popping and snapping and you're like, oh! And you're like, oh. Boy, that kind of feels better. God's going to realign you. He's going to bring you closer to him. Know that he's with you. Know that he loves you. And church, know that he never, ever will abandon you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for giving us this time in your word. Thank you again, Lord, for the things that you're doing. May our eyes always stay upon you. Please, Lord, don't allow us to drift, but allow our heart to stay with yours. And we thank you even now that we can put all our trust and all our hope and all our heart into your care. We can cast our needs upon you. We can cast our cares upon you because your word declares to us, you careth for us. We love you, thank you, praise you, and I ask that you would keep your church family, keep them in your care and your love, and may each one of us know you in a greater way. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, church, if you need anything, you just call. And I'll be praying for you. And I know that the Lord loves you greatly. God bless you. Have a beautiful week in the Lord.